So when I say the word 40, uh, what do we often think of? What, what comes to mind when we hear the number 40? 40 days and 40 nights, the flood, definitely. Yeah, a generation. I mean, I'd like to think a generation these days is a bit more than 40, but in, in the Bible, 40 was a generation, and that ties in with the Exodus, the Exodus. And of course, yes, because it's the day we're talking about, the Ascension, 40 ties in with that as well, it does. Um, 40 years wandering in the wilderness was a generation, that was a length of time in which that generation of unbelievers, those who didn't trust in God's promise and follow him, all died out, except for a couple who, who did remain faithful and they got to see the promised land. Um, yeah, uh, 40 days and 40 nights up on Mount Sinai receiving God's commands. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness after being rescued from Egypt. 40 years ruling as Israel's king. 40 days without food in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. 40 was a significant period of time for Israel, for Moses, for David and for Jesus respectively. And yes, indeed, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus ascended to heaven, as we heard in today's readings from Luke 24 and Acts 1. Father God, open these scriptures to our hearts, our minds, and apply them into our lives through your Holy Spirit, and grant to me your words today, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Luke 24 and Acts 1. I like to think of them as Luke Volume 1 and Luke Volume 2. Dr. Luke wrote both books. And as we heard the first verse in Acts that Narelle read to us, um, the per it's addressed to a person. Dear, did you note what it said? Theophilus. Now, Theos and Philo, uh, one who loves God. Now, we don't know whether that was an actual person by that name or whether it was a general title to anyone who is a believer in the Lord God Most High. And therefore, this account, this eyewitness account and the story of the birth of the church was written for them, for you, for me, for those who love God. Dear Theophilus. And because Luke wrote both of these books, it's the one narrative. What we see here is that the end of the story of Jesus is the church. Believers around the world. And the beginning of the story of the church is Jesus who sends the Holy Spirit. It's hand in glove. They tie in seamlessly. Just imagine this, though. The disciples saw with their own eyes Jesus ascend and then a cloud hid him from their eyes. Imagine being there. What do you reckon that might have looked like? We can think of gimmicks and stunts, like jetpacks. Uh, I've seen um, services where they might rig the preacher up with these uh, stage wires that they use in the theatre and suddenly they get hoisted up. <laughs> Sometimes it can go wrong and the clothes get tangled up and it all goes south very quickly when it's meant to go north. Um, but all these silly gimmicks aside, the ascension of Jesus must have been an incredible sight. And the reaction of the disciples was to actually go into the house of God. The reaction of the disciples was to praise God. They were filled with joy. The ascension of Jesus and seeing it firsthand put the disciples into a frame of mind of worship, a frame of body and spirit of worship worship 
of wanting to be in the Lord's presence. Even though he had just departed from them, they were filled with joy and they worshipped him. They worshipped. And that was the state of mind mixed with a lot of fear of the Jews because they thought, well, okay. There was still fear, wasn't there? But at the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they were awaiting, filled with joy, that promised gift. The disciples saw with their own eyes the ascension of Jesus. And as that cloud hid him from their sight, that other cloud, that veil that had covered their minds, their eyes and their hearts for all this time was removed. They could see clearly now. They knew clearly now that, yes, this indeed was God in the flesh with them, for them, and they knew that their lives and the life of the world from that moment on would not remain the same. Christ was risen. They'd seen it, walked with him, talked with him, been blessed by him, doubted him still, and yet were loved by him despite that. Now Christ is ascended, and one day he will return. It was so clear to them, and it's so clear to us today. The ascension of Jesus was not without precedent. The disciples and anyone who was well-versed in established scripture in Jesus' day, which is what we have as the Old Testament, would have recalled that there's a couple characters, a couple of God's servants in the Old Testament who ascended as well. Does that ring a bell? Elijah, I've heard a couple of you say. Um, and Enoch, Elijah and Enoch are a couple examples. Now Moses um, died and he was buried by God. That was a little different. But Elijah, the prophet, and Enoch, who is mentioned in Genesis chapter 5 and referred to again in Hebrews 11 in the New Testament, uh, and Elijah is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, they both ascended. But the ascension of Jesus is very different because Elijah and before him, much before him, Enoch were living when the Lord took them and they ascended. They didn't die per se, they just stopped being in existence in our realm and they were taken into the heavenly realm. Jesus, however, by stark contrast, died. We confess in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, any Christian who holds to the teaching of Scripture confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart that Jesus died and was buried. He died for them and was raised by God from the dead. And this is the resurrected Jesus. Once dead, now alive, ascends 40 days after his resurrection. And in that meantime, he had appeared many times to many believers, many convincing proofs, conversations, even meals. Remember the fish he ate? What about that time the disciples were out in the boat thinking, what do we do now? And there's this character on the shore. They had no luck, no success whatsoever with the nets. Throw it on the other side. The nets were full. Did they need to ask who this was? They knew. And when they got to shore, there he was with a campfire. He had fish already, like he told them to catch some fish, but he already had the fish on the fire. He had breakfast for them. These sort of things happened during the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Many convincing proofs that he, in fact, is alive. So the ascension of Jesus is quite a distinctive thing from, say, what we might consider the ascension of Elijah or Enoch. Uh, 
This is all well and good, but does the ascension mean anything to us today as believers in Jesus? There's a promise. What does it promise? Yes, just as the resurrection of Jesus and us being part of God's family and when we believe and are baptised and we're saved, we're signed and sealed into God's family, we have that same resurrection in our future that Jesus already has in his past. And yet that ties in with the ascension as well. He was raised. Um, and in today's reading from Acts, um, the, the angels speaking with the disciples promise that just the way you've seen him go, he will return again here. Um, and we have the promise of being raised and ascended into the presence of the Lord God. Very much so. What else does it mean for us today? It gives us hope. Absolutely. It gives us hope that this isn't all there is. This carpe diem business, live your best life now because it's the only one you've got. What a load of rubbish. Um, yes, we steward the gifts God has given us and we don't waste this life. We make the most of it and we leverage it for the kingdom of God in the grace of God by the strength of the Holy Spirit. But this is not all that there is. If this was all that there was, our outlook, our priorities and our actions and our lives would be vastly different, vastly less filled with meaning and purpose and certainly devoid of the power of the resurrection. Yes, we have hope. The ascension gives us hope that Jesus is in the Father's presence. And as we confess in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, he's seated at the right hand of the Father right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. What is that position at the Father's right hand? Why not the left hand? Why is it the right hand? Any ideas? Honour, oh, that's partly, it. it's the position of authority. That's the position of authority. All authority over all things is exercised from the right-hand side of God. I was going to say it's a symbolic thing, but it's probably more than just that. It's, it's a reality that from that place, all authority and reign is exercised over everything that exists, over you, me, God, his son Jesus, was there at the beginning of all things, Genesis 1 and John 1, to make it very clear, and Colossians, I think it's 1 or 2, makes that very clear as well, that, God, that Jesus was there uh, at all creation, uh, holds together through him to this very day. That is the place of authority that Jesus is at God's right hand. And that means something to us today because think on this. Jesus was raised physically from the dead. He ascended physically and bodily to heaven. And that sets him apart from any other being in heaven because all other beings in the spiritual realm are spiritual. Now, Jesus ascended bodily and he will return bodily for his bride, the church, the believers around the world throughout all time. And that makes a difference because he at the Father's right hand, isn't just exercising authority. He continues to be your priest, my priest, our priest, the intermediary or the intercessor, the one who prays to the living, sovereign, almighty God on our behalf. The wounds that he still has in his body bear a testimony on our behalf to the Father as he continually intercedes for us.
that fact should change the world. It should rock our worlds. If you're bullied at school, if you were bullied at some point in your life, Jesus experienced what it was to be bullied by the religious authorities. He lived it and he overcame it with love and forgiveness. If you struggle with a particular sin area in your life that continually seems to be this sort of a stronghold or a trap, Jesus struggled with every temptation in the body as flesh and blood like you and I are flesh and blood and he overcame through perfect obedience. And he's ascended to the Father's right hand, interceding for you, that in him you too may overcome and his wounds continue to bear testimony that you are forgiven. If you're embarking on a new venture, Jesus went through all the struggles of bringing the kingdom of God to earth. And it wasn't what God's people, Israel at the time, had in mind of the Messiah or the kingdom of God. They were thinking only of their own nation. They were thinking politically. And Jesus butted heads with that ideology just constantly in his ministry. He came and he set up that kingdom, that new thing, that new beginning that continues to this day. And for that reason, when God calls you, to something, he will equip you for it. And the kingdom of God continues to grow on this earth to this day. And we can take any other example or scenario from our everyday lives. And the thing is that the ascended Jesus, the fact that Jesus ascended bodily and he's at the Father's right hand, means that he is perfectly positioned to understand completely you and I as flesh and blood, our struggles, our triumphs, because he lived them all. And that makes him perfectly qualified, as well as the blood he shed on our behalf. The Lamb of God who was slain, the Scriptures tell us, is worthy, but it's that empathy with us that, that he understands what he's interceding for. He knows you and me perfectly well. These are some of the things that make this obscure Thursday every year, 40 days after Easter Sunday, so meaningful and so significant and yet so easy to overlook. Earlier this year when we commemorated Epiphany, I reflected on the fact that in some European countries and South American countries and variously around the world, it's a public holiday and it's a festival day. In Australia, it's a work day. Get up, go to work, come home, have dinner, go to bed. Epiphany who? An ascension can be lost in obscurity the same way. But when we understand its significance, it can rock your world and it should because it's a game changer. Father God, thank you for your son Jesus who ascended bodily and as flesh and blood intercedes for us and knows perfectly our struggles, our triumphs. And yes, he's perfectly qualified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to be worshipped and honoured by all living creatures in heaven and on earth and even acknowledged by the fallen realm that he is Lord of all. Amen.